Good evening and welcome to the uh, forum at the uh, Institute of Politics. My name is Charles Royer. I'm the director of the Institute, and uh, I will introduce our moderator uh, for this evening. The uh, mission of the Institute of Politics, uh, which was set up uh, nearly 25 years ago um, as a living memorial to President Kennedy, uh, is to inspire young people uh, to get into public service and politics by example, by bringing interesting political people, uh, interesting people from government into the Institute, allowing people, our undergraduates in particular, uh, to see people who are making change um, in this country. I believe, although it was not explicitly stated, that the mission um, also includes and was meant to uh, include um, the world, um, what is happening uh, on our planet. And today, our students are, as you and I are, uh, inspired and excited um, by the events occurring in Eastern Europe and throughout the Soviet Union, particularly where the Soviet Union is concerned in the Baltic states. So tonight, it's an opportunity to, is an opportunity to experience uh, through the comments of people who are participants, uh, both from this country and from the Baltic states, in the uh, effort to produce free democratic uh, nations uh, in uh, the Soviet Union. Our moderator this evening, uh, who will give you some background and then introduce our distinguished panel, is uh, Anthony Jones, um, who is a professor of sociology at Northeastern University and a fellow of the Russian Research Center uh, here at Harvard. His uh, works include studies of Soviet sociology, Soviet education, pensioners in the USSR, workers in occupational change in the USSR, technology and social organization in Soviet society, private enterprise in the Soviet Union, and public opinion in Poland. His most recent publications include Perestroika and the Economy, New Thinking in Soviet Economics, um, New Cooperatives in the USSR, Examining the Entrepreneurial um, Experimentation uh, in the Soviet Union, um, um, Gorbachev's Social Revolution and many other uh, publications. He's the executive director of the newly formed Transnational Institute, which is a U.S.-USSR organization that sponsors joint Soviet-American social science research and is a member of the consulting company Cambridge East-West Consulting Group Incorporated, based right here in hometown Cambridge, Massachusetts. Earlier this evening, um, we've had an opportunity to uh, listen to our panel discuss uh, what is going on uh, in the Baltic states from their various perspectives and their various areas of expertise. I know that uh, you will learn uh, from this uh, panel and uh, be as inspired as I am about the opportunities which exist um, in that in that. Uh, aggregation of republics where only a few years ago uh, all of what we're talking about would have seemed absolutely unbelievable. Please welcome um, our moderator for this evening, uh, Professor Anthony Jones. Thank you very much. <laughs> Good evening. Um, it's not too many years ago that the idea of a forum such as this, such as this would have seemed absurd, uh, naive maybe, uh, wishful thinking certainly, but it's a reality and as we speak the drama is continuing to unfold. As you may have heard today, um, the oil has been cut off to at least one plant in Lithuania and it remains to be seen what will happen in the next few days. 
What we're witnessing is something that very few generations are privileged to witness, and that is history in the making. It is clear, I think, already that the year 1989 will go down in the history of the 20th century as one of the great years. Unfortunately, great years often mean years of tragedy, but I think that 1989 will go down in 20th century history as a year of hope. As is often the case, the good news is accompanied by unsettling news, anxieties, and new problems. And as we welcome the changes in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, we also face a very uncertain and disquieting future. And the young people here in the audience will, I suspect, spend most of their life living through the consequences of what, have, uh, of, uh, of what has occurred in the last 12 to 15 months in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. We're here this evening to discuss the Baltic area, uh, which consists of three nations which are in many respects very different and yet are tied together uh, through history and geography. It's an alliance, if you like, uh, of, uh, of history rather than an alliance of choice. As you know, the history of these three societies has been rather different, except that they do share in common the incorporation into the Soviet Union as a result of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact of uh, 1939. This was followed in 1940, as you know, by the incorporation of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania into the Soviet Union after what were, by any estimation, fake elections. What's happened since the end of World War II is that these societies have changed, and they have changed in many ways which we can't go into this evening. Brief, briefly, what has happened is that as they have developed economically, their population composition has changed. As these societies have industrialized, people have moved in from other parts of the Soviet Union, in particular from the Russian part, but not exclusively from that. As a result, these um, nations, as they are now declaring themselves, are not homogeneous nations. They are multi-ethnic uh, nations. And this is what is making the transition that we are currently witnessing a rather painful and difficult transition. We're dealing here with three very small countries. If you put them all together, you get something like five and a half million people, which is not very many people. It's smaller than the metropolitan Boston area. And yet their significance on the world scene is clearly um, uh, unmistakable. If we look at Latvia, for example, we can see that they have a mere three million people consisting of only 1% of the entire Soviet population. Lithuania, as you will hear maybe later, is perhaps the most homogeneous of the three nations, 79, 80% of which consists of native Lithuanians. The Russian population, probably the most important non-native part of the population, consists of only 9%. Latvia and Estonia are much smaller. Latvia has about 1.5 million people, consisting of less than half a percent of the population of the Soviet Union, and about half of them are uh, native Latvians and about one-third uh, Russians. This is an important uh, uh, balance, as we'll see later. In Estonia, it, we're dealing with a population of just over one million, um, only 61% of whom are, in fact, Estonians, and again, a rather large percentage, 30% uh, being Russians. It's this multi-ethnic character, particularly of Latvia and Estonia, which makes this transition that we're going through a particularly difficult one. Um, it's understandable that the non-native populations, that particularly the Russians, would have somewhat mixed feelings about the way that things are developing. Ethnic feelings and feelings of separatism, nationalism, and separate identity have survived the entire period of incorporation into the Soviet Union. But it's not been until the last two years that these feelings have come out into the open and have been expressed in concrete action and organization. The real turning point, I think, came in 1987, where for the first time the nationalist sentiments uh, which had been there all along um, became more concrete in the form of overt activities. 
On the anniversary of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact in August of 1987, we saw for the first time open demonstrations against the incorporation of these three nations, uh, first in Estonia and then later in Latvia and, uh, and uh, Lithuania. The real turning point, however, I think, came in April of 1988, when an association of informal groups in Estonia called for a basic change in the relationship between Estonia and Moscow, relationships between the periphery, if you like, and the center. This led very quickly to the creation of an Estonian Popular Front, which was the first to form in the Baltic area, followed very quickly by Popular Fronts in Lithuania and Latvia. In November of 1988, a major event occurred. The Estonian Supreme Soviet declared sovereignty for the Republic of Estonia. Now, this was not a declaration of independence. This was a declaration that Estonia should be, in a sense, in control of its own destiny. But this was very vague, and it certainly was not a declaration of independence. This was followed by a similar vote in the Supreme Soviets in Lithuania in May of 1989, and then in Latvia in July of 1989. And it's really then been only the last six to nine months that the dramatic events that we see unfolding now have gathered speed. The last half of 1989 saw an interesting evolution away from claims to sovereignty, very vaguely defined, to more and more open claims for independence. And it's now these claims to independence which we are um, seeing the uh, new regime in Moscow having to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. In February of this year, the Latvian Supreme Soviet passed a declaration, quote, on the question of independence for the Latvian state, the first time, I think, on which, in which a vote on the question of independence was taken. Again, this was not a declaration of independence, but a step in that direction. This was followed quite quickly by similar votes in Estonia and Lithuania. Early in March, we saw the beginning of a new stage in the developments. The Baltic area saw a meeting which was quite historic. Officials from the three countries met to coordinate their efforts. From now on, their struggle for independence was no longer to be a separate struggle but a coordinated one. On March the 10th, the Lithuanian Supreme Soviet actually voted its independence, as you know. And this vote was an overwhelming vote for independence. There were 124 votes for the motion for independence, no votes against, and only six abstentions. Clearly, at least on the part of the elected officials, there was no doubt as to which path to take. On March the 12th, two days later, at the opening session of the Congress of People's Deputy, Gorbachev described this Declaration of Independence as, and I quote, rather alarming. Three days later, the Congress of People's Deputies took a vote on this declaration and declared it invalid, and they did so by an overwhelming majority. Just to give you an idea of the strength of... Uh, of support for this uh, vote of in, in, in validity. There were 1,463 votes against uh, the Declaration of Independence, only 94 for, and 128 abstentions. What we've seen since March the 15th is essentially a standoff position, which only in the last few days has reached the stage of overt action. And it has not been until today that any concrete action was taken other than uh, taking over buildings and making a show of military uh, strength. One of the ironies of history is that an event long sought by many in the West as well as in the Baltic nations comes at a time when it's difficult to know which side to take. If this had occurred during a period of repression, 
and of conservative reaction in the Soviet Union, our choice would have been an easy one, to side with the Baltic nations in their struggle for a, a regaining of their previous independence. Unfortunately, history has dealt us a rather strange hand. At the moment, we face a reformer in the Soviet Union whose position may be rather weak and certainly is vulnerable in many respects, and we also face the demands and the legitimate demands from the Western point of view of these three nations for independence. And it is this dilemma, whether to support legitimate struggles for independence at the risk of other changes, which we all welcome and see as, I think, quite remarkable, or whether to encourage these societies to go more slowly, to have more care in their timing and in the process whereby they achieve their independence. So this, I think, is the dilemma for the West, and the dilemma for those in the Baltic is clearly even stronger. What we have this evening is three distinguished panelists who will address some of these issues, I hope from different points of view, and will help us to understand why it is that these three nations have taken what are, I think, quite different ways, different paths to independence. The Lithuanians have made an outright declaration of independence and are defending that declaration. The Estonians have been working a little more quietly behind the scenes, as have the Latvians. The question remains, however, how is this transition to be accomplished and what strategies are to be taken and which are locally to be the most effective? I'd like to ask, as our first speaker, Alexei Grigoryev, to address the issue of uh, changes in Latvia. He is the editor of the newspaper Atmoda, at least the Russian version, he assures me, of that newspaper, uh, which roughly translated means awakening. He is also a member of the Latvian People's Front. He is also a deputy of the Supreme Soviet in Latvia and a member of the Parliamentary Commission on Inter-Ethnic Relations. All or any of these would be a difficult task for one person. By former profession, he is a teacher of comparative English literature, which may have given him the calmness of mind necessary to address these very difficult questions. I'd like to introduce Alexei Grigoryev. I would like, uh, first of all, to thank uh, the Institute for the honor and privilege to address uh, well, the students and faculty of uh, such a renowned uh, institution. So thank you. <clears throat> well, and uh, then, well, I would like, of course, to, an to answer uh, questions, and, uh, but uh, uh, to maybe to arouse some interest in what I can uh, say, I shall, uh, I shall start uh, with maybe an, an idea which is uh, less, uh, which has acquired well, less uh, publicity than uh, than uh, maybe other la lately, and that is that we, uh, well, the national movements in the three republics, uh, f actually form a part of a broader movement uh, in the Soviet Union and uh, uh, well and that is the uh, movement for for reform uh, for democratization and uh, well uh, <clears throat> uh, both in economy in politics and in uh, well state composition or in in uh, national questions so nationality question is uh, is just one uh, one uh, part of that and you cannot have uh, have well, a democratic system without uh, without democratizing uh, this uh, uh, nationality uh, rela relations, <clears throat> and uh, but the Baltic question that is regaining or restoring independence of these uh, three captured nations is is part uh, part of that. Uh, and well, the problem of the Soviet Union, or maybe the predicament of the Soviet Union, is that um, 
in order to keep uh, keep the Soviet Union together, the uh, well, uh, there must be strong and well, not democratic uh, democratic uh, force, a central central force. As soon as there is some uh, some democratization, the uh, national question arises. So, uh, so uh, the idea which well, most people in uh, in the Soviet Union and also in Russia uh, understand now. Uh, well, at least, at least, well, very many people in Moscow and Leningrad uh, and understand. Well, I've had a chance to talk to. Well, uh, that is that the Soviet Union, that the, the, this big empire, has to be dismantled. Well, the uh, and then the next question is that this uh, empire has to be dismantled peacefully. Well, and this is this is the predicament again uh, we have. We well. <coughs> And in, uh, in this uh, uh, process, the Baltic, uh, the Baltic countries, have been uh, have moved uh, mostly uh, most ahead uh, ahead of all other uh, other nations uh, nations of the Soviet Union, and uh, with the limited liberty we have already, we've been helping other uh, democratic movements in this in the Soviet Union. Well, both uh, in the national republics and in Russia proper, the first, um, well, maybe I don't know whether you've heard that uh, the Moldavians in uh, in the Soviet Union had to write uh, to use a Cyrillic script uh, during the years of Soviet rule. Now they've returned back to to Latin script, and the first paper that was published in Latin script was published in in Riga, Latvia. And then, uh, well, this uh, publication was smuggled back to to Moldavia, and and, and well, was a part of the of the democratization process there. Well, uh, many uh, many uh, Lat uh, many uh, Russian, uh, Ukrainian, and Belarusian papers are published in in Riga, or uh, or Vilnius. So uh, people uh, come from these parts, and they also will bring materials for us, uh, will uh, uh, write articles for us, and, and well, the paper I edit uh, is widely uh, spread in the in the Soviet Union. Oh, well, it, it's taken uh, taken to Moscow and Kiev and and Kishinev, and uh, well, uh, the inform uh, the information. Uh, about the popular movements is uh, is uh, taken from uh, from this uh, this paper. Well, and as to the <coughs> to the inter uh, inter ethnic relations in the Baltic uh, the Baltic uh, countries themselves, uh, I should say that uh, the it is not simply a national or nationalist movement, but it is a democratic movement. And it is supported not only well, especially, well in Latvia and Estonia and in Lithuania alike, not only by ethnic uh, Lithuanians, Estonians and Latvians, but also by democratically minded people of all nationalities. And <clears throat> well, for instance, in, uh, the, in the results of uh, elections, uh, show that uh, in Latvia, where the where Russian-speaking minority, uh, well, is almost a majority, it, it constitutes uh, a, a 48 percent of the population. Well, and the Popular Front uh, has one almost two thirds, and most probably, when the by-elections are over, there will be two thirds uh, of the uh, Supreme Soviet that is a local par local parliament. So that shows that the Popular Front is not a movement of Latvians alone, but it's a movement, uh, well, a democratic movement of the whole the whole nation, uh, comprised of uh, Latvians, uh, Estonian, uh, Latvians, Russians, Ukrainians, uh, and Belarusians. Well, maybe that is that is all that I wanted to uh, to start with, and I'd like to answer questions. Maybe we should uh, maybe we should continue with the other speakers and then have a, a floor discussion at the end. Okay. Our next speaker is Tun Kellum, 
who is the chairman of the Council of Estonia, which is a standing committee elected by the Congress of Estonia. He's also a board member of the Estonian National Independence Party and by profession, an historian and political commentator. I'd like to introduce Tun McKellen. Good evening. It's my pleasure to be here and uh, to be able to explain uh, some problems of the Baltic nations to this distinguished audience. I would like to make a comparison. In the year 1939, under the Munich Agreement, Czechoslovakia was occupied and annexed by the Nazi, Nazi Reich. It was transformed into the Bohemian and Moravian Protectorate. But instead, in spite of that, uh, by all legal criteria, it continued to be independent Czechoslovak state, only under occupation. And when the Czechoslovakian statehood was restored in 1945, no one could say that Bohemian and Moravian Protectorate had seceded from the German Reich. It was obvious <laughs> that only normal democratic governing structure was restored to Czechoslovakian state. So is the case with the Baltic nations. Occupied nations do not secede from, uh, imp uh, from the imperials which have occupied them. Baltic struggle has for independence has now entered its decisive phase. I think one of the major uh, achievements of the past two or three years has been overall consensus that has been reached in Baltics that the only way out to solve various very dramatic problem, problems must be a restoration of full independent statehood. This is not, a, not only a theoretical dilemma, it's a question of uh, uh, it's a democrat, uh, demographic crisis, question of demographic crisis. It's an ecological crisis, and it's also economic crisis. It has been, become obvious that after various ways out were probed, halfway solutions, more opportunist approaches, even the initiators of so-called economic independence program, which was proposed some three years ago, came recently to conclusion that all those problems could be tackled successfully only by having political control over, over our own affairs. It also has now become clear that there's no way back from these demands. The Baltic problem is there and it can't be ignored anymore. It is there to be solved for the West, also for Moscow, and of course for the Baltic nations themselves. As, I, as it has been said already, no session, secession uh, can be considered as for the Baltic states. They constitute a special case legally. They were occupied, so they must not leave the Soviet Union, which they have never joined legally. Only the Soviet occupation forces must leave the territories of the Baltic states. So I would say that our most important problem is not proclaiming newly independence, but to get out the Soviet occupation army from the territory of, of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. 
is a, it's the presence of this enormous army, 150,000 men in Estonia, stationed in Estonia for a population of 1.6 million. That means one Soviet soldier, soldier for every five native Estonians, which has constituted the real basis for the present political structure which has been created since the beginning of the occupation. So, our di dilemma in Estonia has been recently, is it possible to restore genuine democracy and independence proceeding from the basis of illegality and injustice? In other words, there's a choice between let us say, Vichy way, if we compare Estonia's situation to that of France under Nazi occupation, was it possible to restore democracy in France based on Vichy government and Pétain administration? Or was it possible to do that based on De Gaulle's and Free France movement? I think we have found a measure of compromise under the present circumstances. But what was most important for us was just how to restore bases, foundations, for real and genuine democracy. I would say the, pres the present view of the Baltic political scenery it has been sometimes one-sided. There's been talk only about Soviet-style uh, Supreme Soviets, which have been named parliaments, which they really are not. And uh, uh, even some members of the new Estonian Supreme Soviet have proposed, ha have uh, made proposal, propose, proposals not to name Estonia Supreme Soviet a, a parliament. We must wait for elections to the real parliament uh, until the Soviet occupation army has left our soil or at least until it has been politically neutralized. So not to uh, intimidate the population uh, and being obstacle to free choice. So in February last year, three independent Estonian political movements, Estonian Heritage Society, Estonian National Independence Party, and Christian Democratic Union uh, started a citizen's initiative to elect a first democratic representative body which would be authorized to concentrate and voice the demands of the citizens of Estonia since the beginning of the occupation. The aim was to create an alternative political infrastructure under the conditions of occupation. That goal seem, seemed impossible to achieve, but nevertheless, initiative was made and uh, after a few months in every parish a citizens committee was elected which started registering citizens of independent Estonian state. Uh, those people who, who used to be or whose parents or grandparents used to be citizens of Estonian state before the beginning of occupation. Uh, these citizens' committees came together and elected county committees. County committees came together and elected general committee of Estonian citizens. That was in November last year. And this general committee had authority to prepare elections for the Congress of Estonia which is considered to be a sort of halfway parliament, but uh, 
all in all a first legal representative body of Estonia citizenships. Elections to the Congress of Estonia took place on 24th of February this year. There were 110 uh, districts uh, uh, and 1,200 candidates for 464 seats in, a, in, a, in the Congress of Estonia. In addition, 35 delegates from among Estonians living abroad were elected to the Congress of Estonia. So, uh, in spite of all skepticism, intimidation from the side of Soviet authorities, a genuine political alternative has now been created. And we consider it to be a real revolutionary achievement. I would like to quote, quote a Swedish uh, leader of moderate party who visited, who was a guest of the Congress of Estonia and who admitted that the mandate of the Congress of Estonia is clear. It's beyond any doubt. By all the standards of democracy, this Congress is a representative body of the Estonians. Anyway, considering practical uh, conditions, there has now been started a very interesting transi transition period. Uh, a parallel power structure uh, between Congress of Estonia, who has sole authority to decide about political status of Estonia, and between the local Supreme Soviet. We consider it a very important achievement that for the first time a Soviet-style organ like Supreme Soviet followed suit and obeyed to the general policies of Congress of Estonia, agreeing that the ultimate aim of this transi transition period must be restoration of the pre-war Estonia Republic. The difference with the Lithuanian way could be seen just in the formula that not a new republic was proclaimed, but what was proclaimed was a period of restoration of independent Estonia Republic to uh, give authority once more to the constitution of pre-war Estonia Republic. No definite terms were set. That was a, a calculated move not to provoke any immediate Soviet reaction. The aim of the Estonian model of development has been to convince the Soviet authorities that it is in their best interest to come to terms with legitimate claims of the Baltic nations. Uh, Baltic independence and its restoration must be seen as an integral part of the liquidation of the Hitler-Stalin Pact of 1939. It is not necessarily a precedent for independence for other parts of the Soviet Union. And I, I see it as a very vital opportunity for Moscow uh, to declare the occupation of Baltic countries as a st uh, to admit the occupation of the Baltic countries as a Stalinist mistake and to begin to evacuate the Soviet occupation forces from Baltic area. Uh, Mr. Gorbachev has proposed a common European home but we must always bear in mind that this future common European home has decent rooms, not prison cells. 
So you can't have peace and stability without, without restoring genuine justice and freedom in Eastern European region. So our proposal to Moscow has been it's better even for Moscow to have four <coughs> neutral and friendly Finlands on its western borders instead of only one Finland and three continuously mutinous Baltic provinces. The Baltic Way is a way of democratic and peaceful development. We consider it our major achievement that we have succeeded of avoiding violence and intercommunal hatred. A way out for those people who, as a result of Moscow's imperialist policies, have come and settled down in Baltic areas has also uh, proposed all these peoples, except personnel of the Soviet Army, can uh, ask and apply for Estonia citizenship. This citizenship can be granted to them by independent Estonian parliament. Elections to uh, this parliament could take place after the end of the occupation or, as I have said, uh, after the political neutralization of the Soviet occupation army. So we have now real hopes that with a Western understanding and political support, the independent Baltic countries could make a very practical and vital contribution to the stability of Eastern Europe, helping just because of restoration of independence, also genuine, genuine democratization and perestroika process to be, to be continued also in Russia and other parts of the Soviet Union. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. To put the case for Lithuania, if that's not uh, overstating it a little, we have Lauren, Laurie Wyman, who is a colleague of mine at the Russian Research Center. By profession, she is a lawyer. Her involvement in Lithuania um, came about because she was invited by Sayudis and by the new government in Lithuania to go to Lithuania and consult on legal issues. She is also a member of the Lawrence Tribe Group, which is advising the Lithuanian government on the political changes. I'd like to introduce Laurie Wyman. It's a great privilege to be able to address you today. Uh, I apologize, I do have a bit of a cold, and uh, if I stop and cough or blow my nose, I hope you won't mind. It was very exciting to be able to be in Lithuania when it proclaimed the restoration of independent statehood. And in order to give you the flavor of the moment, I wish to read the act on the restoration of the Lithuanian state. It's been mentioned in the press as the Declaration of Independence. I don't think that's entirely correct, and I also didn't see it published in the Western press in full. Supreme Council of the Republic of Lithuania, Act on the Restoration of the Lithuanian State. The Supreme Council of the Republic of Lithuania, expressing the will of the nation, resolves and solemnly proclaims that the execution of the sovereign power of the Lithuanian state, heretofore constrained by alien forces in 1940, is restored, and henceforth Lithuania is once again an independent state. The February 16, 1918 Act of Independence of the Supreme Council of Lithuania and the May 15, 1920 
Constituent Assembly resolution on the restoration of a democratic Lithuanian state have never lost their legal force and are the constitutional foundation of the Lithuanian state. The territory of Lithuania is integral and indivisible, and the constitution of any other state has no jurisdiction within it. The Lithuanian state emphasizes its adherence to universally recognized principles of international law, recognizes the principle of the inviolability of borders as formulated in Helsinki in 1975 in the final act of the Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe, and guarantees the rights of individuals, citizens, and ethnic communities. The Supreme Council of the Republic of Lithuania expressing sovereign power by this act begins to achieve the state's full sovereignty. And it was signed by Vytautas Landsbergis, the chairman of the Supreme Council of the Republic of Lithuania, who has been called the president of the Independent Republic of Lithuania. When I returned from the Soviet Union at the end of March, I went to Moscow from Vilnius on March 21st. I was shocked to read in the press the number of statements about secession from the Union and about uh, heeding the voice of reason, Gorbachev's voice of reason. And I would also like to read something else, just so that once and for all, the actual history of the annexation of Lithuania by the USSR is clear and what the legal basis bases are for Lithuania declaring that under international law it is an independent state. On March 22nd, uh, President Landsbergis wrote to Gorbachev, the annexation of Lithuania by the USSR violated the terms of Lenin's Declaration of Rights of the Peoples of Russia of November 15, 1917, the Soviet-Lithuanian Peace Treaty of July 12, 1920, the Lithuanian-Soviet Treaty of Non-Aggression of September 28, 1926, the Kellogg-Brien Pact of 1929, the Lithuanian-Soviet Mutual Assistance Pact of October 10, 1939, and the Covenant of the League of Nations. So there are a number of violations here that are never mentioned. In light of the fact that Lithuania had come under Soviet occupation by June 1940, all subsequent actions of Soviet authorities in Lithuania designed to subvert and destroy the nation's sovereignty were void ab initio, including all such actions instituted by the government of Joseph Stalin. And you know about that. The government of the Republic of Lithuania also wishes to remind the Supreme Soviet of the USSR that the USSR government declared in its 1920 peace treaty with Lithuania that it recognized without reservation and for all time the sovereign rights and independence of the Lithuanian state. Lithuania has never formed, juridically speaking, part of the territory of the USSR and that there is no legal justification for the validity of the 1977 USSR Constitution or other Soviet laws with respect to Lithuanian territory. Now, just for the sake of argument, I'd like to refer to the kinds of things that are said in the Soviet press, because I've seen them in the Western press. In Izvestia on March 28th, there was an article, uh, actually it was in the form of an interview and uh, the caption of the article is called The, the Road to Independence, uh, the Lithuanian situation in the mirror of international law. And the first question that's asked is, why does Lithuania insist that it's an independent nation without regard to the law of secession? And why is that wrong? And the answer to the interview is, well, I don't know. Lithuania must leave the Union because it's a member of the Soviet Union. Because there was a marriage between Lithuania and the Soviet Union. Even though maybe it wasn't a legal marriage, but according to international principles, when you have a divorce, you still have to resolve the questions of property. So when you have a separation between people, I guess this is a palimony argument.
Then uh, he goes on to say that uh, according to international principles, uh, before you can declare independence, you have to work out all the legal details. And one of the phrases that's used in this is, is um, legal succession, legal все вопросы права преемства, legal succession. So unless you have all the details worked out, you, you can't do anything. Um, in that connection, one of the things that, that Soviets do, and this gentleman does, is to refer to to precedent in Western nations. So he refers to Italy and France and other Western European countries and says, well, this is, this is quite a phenomenon. And the, in the constitutions of Western European countries, they don't provide for secession. But we provide for secession in our constitution. Therefore, we provide for a right that uh, doesn't exist in the developed Western European countries. And therefore, we're much better than Western Europe. We're further advanced. Uh, he mentions when he refers to the question of legal succession and continuity that this is based on an, an English scholar uh, who I don't know whether he's alive or dead, but I wouldn't want to be referred to in this article. Um, he also mentions more than once that what the Lithuanians are doing is not what is done in the civilized world. He says, you ask me how these questions are decided in the civilized world, and I will tell you how they are decided in the civilized world. And I would like to bring to your attention, just in case you didn't happen to watch McNeil Lehrer last night, that we had a Soviet legal scholar explain that uh, Lithuania was attempting to blackmail the Soviet Union because it was pressuring the Soviet Union to make a decision with respect to its future and that if the decision were not made properly, perhaps there'd be some consequences for the summit. So Lithuania was, was engaged in blackmail. And that was not civilized. And uh, Mr. Lazaritis, who was sitting at the same table with this gentleman, uh, said, well, is it civilized to uh, bring tanks in and to threaten people and to remove uh, soldiers by force from psychiatric hospitals? And is it, is it uh, civilized to take over buildings and to put, literally put the fear of God into uh, ordinary human beings? When all we have said is that we are happy to negotiate on any point except rescinding the Declaration of Independence, which by the way, no country has ever done. Another thing that this gentleman mentions in the article is that, uh, of course, you need to have a referendum, that it, it's not done uh, in other, other parts of the world in a civilized fashion if you don't have a referendum, that uh, you must have something on the order of a referendum or a plebiscite. We call it a referendum in the Soviet Union. And by the way, uh, if such a referendum were conducted, we would have to conduct the census in Lithuania completely differently because Lithuania violates international norms in conducting the census. It's just shameful, and so on. Um, then uh, it's mentioned because of, of, the, of the concern about returning territory and so forth that, of course, there would be a question of returning uh, the Vilnius Krai or uh, Klaipeda, uh, which is a town um, on, <clears throat> on the sea, and then possibly some other territories to uh, the Republic of Belarus, and that um, perhaps these, these territories would prefer to be part of the Union. And in the Soviet Union, we don't make decisions unless we take everyone's interests into account. And uh, Lithuania is not taking the interests of everyone into account. Yesterday, I was at a forum at which uh, two people spoke, and uh, the, the speaker read a statement by Josef Brodsky, uh, a, a Nobel laureate uh, who has lived in this country for a long time and who speaks English more beautifully than I could ever hope to speak English. And he expressed his attitude towards the Americans' position, uh, that is, the administration's position with respect to Lithuania, as thoroughly disgusting. And I have to tell you that that's how I look at it also. I want to give you some more background into Soviet law, aside from the, the kind of legal argumentation that is in the Soviet press about 
international norms without reference to any treaties that were ever concluded or any specific international norms that were ever violated or perhaps any questions that, uh, that should be properly resolved in an international forum. The, the Soviet Constitution, uh, in my understanding of constitutions, is not a constitution at all. It's a declaration of, of political attitudes or rights. Uh, uh, the person attempting to refer to it or rely upon it is told that the Constitution is not self-executing, that you need another law to somehow effectuate the provisions of the Constitution. And I need only remind you that this is the case in uh, the provision Article 72 uh, with respect to the uh, right to secede. Article 72 guarantees the right to secede, but someone noted that you don't have a mechanism to uh, fulfill that right. So there needs to be a law to somehow fulfill that right. Therefore, the right in the Constitution it means nothing at all. Well, I'd like to tell you what has been done to fulfill the right to secede in the law that was passed on April 3rd by uh, the two chambers of the Supreme Soviet. Unfortunately, I've not yet seen the Russian version of the law. I'm relying on, on uh, Radio Liberty uh, reports uh, on the contents uh, because as far as I know, it's not yet been published in, in the Soviet newspapers. Um, th this is what uh, the law on secession provides, that uh, two-thirds of the citizens of the USSR permanently re resident in the republic in question, that is, not the citizens of the republic as defined by the republic itself. Uh, are supposed to vote in a referendum. But um, in a, such a case, uh, this uh, republic could lose, I'm sorry, I'm speaking too close to the microphone. Uh, the republic could lose any autonomous territories that did not belong to this republic at the time it became a part of the Soviet Union, and possibly also districts uh, inhabited predominantly by members of nationalities other than the titular nationality of the republic. Um, after the referendum has been concluded and for the process to begin, it must be two-thirds, as I mentioned, there's a period of five years uh, in which uh, presumably the, the basic questions, financial matters, territorial matters, um, economic matters are resolved between all of the parties. It doesn't say what happens if they're somehow not resolved, but let's assume for the moment that something is resolved. Then. Uh, once this is done, uh, this, the result is presented to the Congress of People's Deputies to come to a final decision as to what to do. So that even at that point, the Congress of People's Deputies can decide to reject the uh, request, now I say, request for permission to secede. During that five-year period, uh, it's possible for anyone to raise, again, the question of secession. You only need... 10% of the Republic to raise this question, to, to put the whole question again. If there's a vote on secession and it doesn't go through after this five-year period, uh, you can raise it one more time, but only after a second interval of 10 years. I think you can see why uh, people in, La in Lithuania and Latvia and Estonia and, and all the other Republics think that this is a law against secession and not for secession. In addition, there's been, there have been statements that, that uh, to support the Baltics in their efforts to assert independent statehood is somehow to undermine Gorbachev's position and undermine the very salutary uh, processes that are underway in the Soviet Union. I want to bring your attention to a couple of other laws that were recently passed that I didn't see mentioned in the Western press. Um, there was a law that was passed on April 5th that's called um, the Law on Strengthening Responsibility for Infringements of National, uh, uh, the Equal Rights of Nationalities and the Violent um, Breach of the Unity of the Territory of the USSR. Uh, I think you can you can expect what's in this law. Uh, it uh, provides for criminal penalties for anyone who is going to attempt to change the territory of the USSR. Uh, so that anyone who is in the current Supreme Council of Lithuania 
uh, would be subject to criminal penalties under this law. In addition, oh, uh, I should mention to you, it's sort of interesting that this was not mentioned in the Western press at all because last year when Gorbachev uh, attempted to change um, what was the basis of Article 70 of the Criminal Code of the RSFSR into something much more uh, unpleasant, uh, that is anyone calling for the overthrow of the government uh, and using Xerox machines to spread uh, uh, the uh, appeals to overthrow the government or change the social structure of the Soviet Union. Um, this, um, this decree caused quite a furor in the West, and there was such, such a, uh, an outcry of protest that eventually it was changed to provide for only violent call, uh, calls for violent uh, uh, overthrow of the government. Um, this, this particular article that I just referred to is a, um, is a revision of that same article. Uh, and uh, for some reason, it just passed notice altogether. At the same time, three minutes, all right. At the same time, uh, in addition to the presidency, which I'm sure you've read about in the Western press, which permits the president to do anything he wants uh, by decree, there is also a new law that was passed on declaring emergency uh, an emergency situation in the country. And I would like to draw your attention to the fact that this was, this was passed on April 9th, and uh, the, the president is, is able to, under this law, to declare a state of national emergency and to take a whole variety of measures, including some pretty extraordinary things, uh, one of the things that I enjoyed was uh, 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 insisting on the forced labor of citizens, if that was necessary, uh, preventing uh, the use of all kinds of uh, Xerox machines or radios or televisions, uh, if that's necessary, um, to uh, overturn any order of the local government uh, that's taken if, if he doesn't like it, um, to punish by, crim by criminal means anyone who, who spreads rumors um, that uh, it's hard to say whether they really, really would uh, uh, have any effect on public order because of how Soviet law is generally interpreted. But anyway, what I wish to say is that the image that Gorbachev currently has of being a person who's advancing democratization and liberal attitudes I, I don't think is is borne out by the statutes that were passed in the wake of his, his uh, accession to the presidency. I might add, with respect to his, his respect for the rule of law, uh, he was voted in as president. I witnessed the voting in violation of the very procedures by which uh, the presidency was, was uh, voted on. And someone mentioned that to him, and he uh, shouted that person down in the room. So he's not legally, even presently, uh, the head of state. Um, my, uh, my time is up. I want to just say that I think that anything that is done in support of the genuine process of, demo of democratic reform and genuine Western principles of, of uh, freedom and uh, liberty that are being advanced in the Baltics should be supported by the United States. And I hope that anyone who is in this room will send a letter to President Bush to ask him to do that, because I don't see any, any uh, reason to delay. Things are only going to get worse in the Soviet Union. And believe me, there are many people in the other republics who are hoping for that support so that they can further their own cause for freedom. Thank you.
Thank you very much. While people are moving down to the microphones, we have one here and one over here. I'd like to uh, express our appreciation to Tom Teal, the associate editor of the Harvard Business Review, who uh, was the, uh, the force behind this evening's forum. He was the one who put the, uh, the evening together, and I'd just like to express our, our thanks to him for doing that. We have approximately 20 minutes or so for discussion, and uh, maybe I'll start here with this gentleman. Yes, I'd like to ask the panel. Um, <clears throat> according to the sources Ms. Wyman brought up, it's pretty clear that Gorbachev will not stop with merely an economic blockade or his usual threatening tactics. Um, are there plans for perhaps like a general strike or massive civil disobedience in case of an actual Soviet um, violent um, aggression against the independent Republics? Uh, anyone of the panel? <laughs> I'll try to answer. I can't, uh, I can't uh, tell you about any specific plans like civil disobedience. I think partly it could be counterproductive, but I think uh, economic blockade can never be perfect under the modern circumstances. So I think. Uh, especially uh, Lithuanians and Estonians have something uh, 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 we, we could use as an answer to the Soviet blockade. We are exporting our electric energy to Leningrad area. Uh, the Soviet Union would require, require our dairy products, our meat, our potatoes, our commodity goods. So I doubt if it would make any sense for the for Moscow to implement economic blockade. The only thing we, we would need is gas and oil. And I think there are just now negotiations in process to, uh, to, uh, to uh, with, the, with Norwegian government, between Lithuanian representatives and Norwegian government to, to get supplies perhaps from Norway. Well, I would like to add maybe to that <clears throat> that one third of all uh, uh, hard currency the Soviet Union is getting uh, comes through the uh, port uh, uh, port of Ventspils, Latvia, because oil uh, will is exported through this uh, port. So uh, if uh, there is anything to disrupt that flow, uh, well, the Soviet Union will suffer uh, terribly. Thank you. The Soviets have a long history of using the words that we cherish, such as democracy, liberty, and using them in perverse means to apply to themselves. And all three of the speakers today have alluded to this technique uh, as continuing, uh, such as calling the Supreme Soviets parliaments, calling these uh, chairmen of the various committees presidents, uh, alluding to the parallel between um, Mr. Gorbachev and Mr. Bush. Uh, that Mr. Bush has a Congress to deal with, uh, Mr. Gorbachev has his Congress to deal with, even Mr. Jones alluded to the vote in the uh, People's Congress. Um, uh, Laurie Wyman talked about things that are not reported that happen in the Soviet Union, such as various laws that are passed that just aren't ignored. Uh, why do you think this happens, that we allow the Soviets to set the terms of reference to call Baltic issues internal affairs, to imply there's some connection or some analogy between the U.S. Civil War and what's currently taking place in the breakup of the Soviet Empire. And what can we do to remedy this situation? Um, if all three of you care, would care to comment, I'd like to hear what you have to say. Well, uh, I, I, for one, don't understand why the distinctions are made. I think it has primarily to do with the fact that there is a great deal of disinformation that gets in our Western press. And in order for our press to say it presents all points of view, it ends up presenting points of view that don't get sufficiently repudiated. Um, and all I can say with that is that every time uh, an article appears that is way off the beam, you need to respond, you need to call and protest. Uh, 
me to some extent is um, uh, a contra uh, obvious contradiction between the Western theoretical approach, the policy of non-recognizing the Baltic uh, occupation and annexation, and uh, uh, as a result, non-recognizing also political structures created by the Soviet occupation authorities, and between the practical approach of uh, in fact recognizing that there are now uh, a sort of legal or more democratic parliaments uh, existing in the Baltic area. Uh, I would say there's a long way to go to, uh, to restore real parliamentary democracy. And in my opinion, what we badly need it is just to have a real alternative, a genuine democratic alternative to the Soviet-style organs. That's what Estonians are, have started to do just now. Well, maybe uh, I would add to that that there is an uh, old tradition indeed of uh, of double talk yeah, and double double think, which uh, Orwell has uh, brought uh, out very well in, in his 1984, uh, and this tradition is still continuing. Uh, well, but uh, I'd like also to add uh, to that that uh, the Congress uh, in Moscow that elected the uh, so-called president, uh, Gorbachev, is uh, by one-third appointed by the same president or will, or, uh, will bodies that are uh, well, very close to him, like the Communist Party, Central Committee, and uh, will the, uh, the uh, trade unions, which are also another edition of the Communist Party, and, 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 uh, and other uh, uh, organizations of the kind. Uh, but I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't, well, of course, I'd also pay more attention uh, to uh, other elected bodies which uh, appear now uh, on the Soviet political scene. Uh, of, of one of uh, <laughs> such bodies, I am myself a member, and that is uh, the Supreme Soviet of Latvia. Well, elected, of course, under uh, well occupation. Uh, and yet, uh, although these circumstances are not normal, the uh, the uh, these bodies, some of uh, some of them, uh, may be rather close uh, to what, uh, in the Western sense, would be would be a parliament. Of course, it is not uh, well uh, a parliament in full sense, but it's well uh, some steps uh, well in that direction. I would also uh, view uh, in this light. Uh, the uh, city council of Moscow, the city council of Leningrad, which are also will uh, <coughs> uh, have a democratic democratic majority, uh, b just because the democratic process in these major towns of Russia has uh, has gone uh, well far enough to allow for this a democratic uh, democratic majority. Uh, so these will maybe uh, well these bodies will maybe playing uh, some kind of a role of uh, intermediate bodies between, well, complete uh, dictatorship that we had and uh, real democracy, which we hope to have in future. Thank you. Um, as uh, Dr. Jones Dula noted, uh, today um, Moscow stopped uh, oil to a refinery in uh, Lithuania, from what I understood, um, though he did note it, it's the only refinery in Lithuania. Um, uh, Mr. Grigorjevs um, spoke of, about cooperation between Baltic republics. I'd be curious to know what uh, are both uh, Estonia and Latvia are ready to do about it uh, in case they stop uh, gas in addition to oil because it's a little more serious uh, than uh, in the United States since most people cook on gas. Well, I imagine uh, there there are some uh, some uh, 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 there is some uh, gas already stored in uh, well in in uh, all three of the republics, but uh, 
Well, some or some gas is produced uh, in Estonia. I think there can be some uh, some cooperation uh, in uh, well uh, there, uh, but uh, but uh, I don't think there are any any well uh, any other plans worked out. At least not uh, at least I don't know about them. So, I support. Uh, the independence of the Baltic countries and U.S. recognition uh, uh, of that independence. Uh, the government of the United States at the current uh, <coughs> moment is not ready to do so. I'd like to ask the speakers uh, for as long a list as possible of what steps short of recognition of the independence of the Baltic countries uh, you would hope or recommend that the United States government take uh, in the next few days or weeks? Well, any support is welcome, of course. But, uh, but uh, we shouldn't, uh, we should, I think, uh, have in mind that, that uh, recognition of, of the governments is uh, of paramount importance because uh, well these uh, governments Well, I, I, well, actually, I think well any 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 kind of, su of support uh, support is is important, but. Uh, well, these governments, or, or, or maybe the movements uh, that have produced these governments, have been uh, working on the presumption that uh, the uh, well, United States hadn't recognized the incorporation of the Soviet, uh, well, of uh, of these three Baltic states uh, by the Soviet Union. Well, and now when this uh, when this uh, non-recognition uh, doctrine has to be worked upon. Well, this, the United States uh, will uh, refrain from from that action, which would be all, uh, only logical and necessary. So this uh, comes as a surprise. I would like to add that uh, what is needed just now is a very clear and strong stand by the United States administration as for its principles of the Baltic policy. That, mean, that would mean repetition of the tradi traditional U.S. stand on the Baltic question. Uh, uh, and uh, in addition, a clear warning to Moscow that using force or economic blockade would very seriously impair, impair economic relations uh, developing between East and West. And also what is needed, in my opinion, is uh, uh, an opal, open, perhaps not uh, yet recognition, but acknowledgement of the new political structures, independent structures, which has been created uh, in, in Baltic countries just now. In addition, what might be helpful could be uh, some sort of upgrading uh, of existing Baltic diplomatic missions in the United States. As you know, there are Latvian, Lithuanian, and Estonian legations and consulates existing uh, as, uh, as uh, embodying con continuation of independent states. So, what would be helpful uh, is also exchange of parliamentary delegations between U.S. Congress and uh, Baltic countries uh, to include Baltic countries into uh, U.S. package of aid for Eastern Europe and, uh, uh, and um, also to include Baltic questions into conventional armaments reduction talks. I think we have to, uh, it, would, it would be very practical to, uh, to have a link between evacuation or reduction of Soviet troops in Eastern European area and uh, also uh, 
between start of evacuation of those troops uh, from Baltic area. And also, of course, this discussing Baltic independence question uh, on the next European Security and uh, uh, Cooperation Conference, the second Helsinki Conference. I would add that uh, it should be a topic uh, for the summit. Uh, that is, that's a necessary part of the agenda for the summit because if the United States is serious about helping to create the genuine possibility of the rule of law in the Soviet Union, the way the Soviet Union has been treating the Baltics uh, doesn't bode well. And the condemnation of the acts that have taken place already uh, needs to be made very clear uh, to the Soviets, both in public and in private. I uh, think there has to be something on the agenda that addresses the question of how you create good neighborly relations based on mutual agreement rather than force. The Soviet Union seems to be taking the position that Lithuania cannot be an equal partner, cannot enter into negotiations as, as uh, an equal partner, a full state. Uh, it's something more than a question of the Soviet Union talking to another republic uh, of the Soviet Union has to do with the way the Soviet Union treats people in negotiations, and I think this needs to be pointed out. Uh, there has to be somewhere down the line uh, the creation of opportunities for rational economic ties between republics and between nations, and this is an opportunity for the United States to participate in the development of rational economic ties with the Baltic states and the creation of opportunities for the disentanglement of the Baltic states uh, on an economic level. If the United States should wish to make a positive contribution, now is the time to do it because it's going to come up in the context of the rest of the Soviet Union, perhaps much sooner than anyone would like. Uh, we're supposed to finish at 9.30, but since there's clearly interest in, in the, uh, the subject and the panel, Maybe we could uh, run over a little bit. Um, gentleman over here. Well, I was interested to know what you think, uh, what kind of support you can hope to get out of the Soviet Union, out of the, the people of the Soviet Union for your independence movement, particularly in the Russian republics. Well, I don't doubt the support for liberalization and democratization in the Soviet Union and support for independence among places like Georgia and Moldavia and Armenia, how much and how large or how broad to the support do you think you can gain for Baltic independence in the great Russian republics, even among the more liberal elements in Russia? Or does great Russian nationalism tend to overshadow that? Well, the problem with Russia is <coughs> that the government uh, of this country doesn't have uh, to pay much attention to what the people of the country think. And uh, this is the case we, uh, we witness now. There have been major demonstrations uh, in uh, Leningrad and Moscow in support of Lithuanian um, independence. Uh, under the uh, well, motto, Hands Off Lithuania. Uh, there was a mass also movement uh, in support of Lithuanian uh, independence in the Ukraine. Uh, <clears throat> well, we receive, I mean, even, even in the paper I edit, receive letters and telegrams in support of Lithuanian independence. Uh, people's uh, deputy, uh, Yuri Afanasyev, one is of uh, uh, well, uh, well-known uh, Russian liberal historians, uh, is I think even currently in Vilnius, uh, supporting uh, supporting uh, uh, the government, the Lithuanian government. Well, and he goes uh, to, uh, to the demonstrations where were well organized by, by conservative Russians trying to persuade them that Lithuanian independence is in their interest and that they have to, find, to come to terms with the, with the government of the country they live in. Uh, so there is uh, this movement and I think it, it is uh, on the, uh, well, it is growing. So, for instance, in a year or so when there's possibly even more democratic 
forces in the country, in, in Russia, maybe uh, after some elections, you hope to gain some support? Yes, and we, I, I'm sure that we are going to get support from the, uh, from the councils of Moscow and Leningrad. Uh, well, uh, we, we, well, the uh, People's uh, Congress of uh, the Russian Federation is uh, convening on, uh, well, in mid-May, so we shall see what happens there. Thank you. Question on Lithuania. Um, the moral, ethical, legal arguments, very cogent, uh, unassailable, notwithstanding, was the step taken by Lithuania practical vis-a-vis -vis Moscow? In other words, Lowry, when you were there, did you get a sense that perhaps Mr. Landsbergis took a giant step when he should have taken smaller steps? Was there a sense that if Brzezowskis was in power uh, leading the country that perhaps it may have been handled a little better? I, I thought it was handled magnificently. So I guess I would start. I would start by, by saying that, uh, that uh, I couldn't imagine a, a more cohesive group run by a more, more dedicated and talented man than Vitauskas Landsbergis. Uh, when I arrived, I didn't know what Mr. Landsbergis looked like. So I went into a room and witnessed uh, conversations and, and tried to figure out who, who was who. And there was someone off to the side who, who seemed very special. And I wasn't sure who it was. He came, later came over to shake my hand. And I learned later that that was Mr. Landsbergis. This man has, um, to my uh, limited experience, uh, the makings of a very great leader. I have not had uh, the opportunity in my lifetime to see other leaders uh, of his greatness up front, except perhaps Andrei Dmitrievich Sakharov. But this man is that, that sort of person, the same caliber. Uh, he uh, is able to bring people together. He's able to run a discussion so that all of the pros and cons of a particular issue are discussed and so that a consensus is reached. And he's even able to leave room for those people who very strongly oppose a particular view that he's adopting, room to disagree and then to proceed along with the majority. I think Lithuania is very lucky to have him. And the only reason that Brazauskas, uh, in my view, was given the public acclaim that he was is that he indeed has, has a personality. He's, he's uh, very engaging. He is an accomplished politician. And he had the benefit of state television behind him all the way while he was uh, moving as uh, the uh, at the forefront of the independence movement. Hi, uh, my question is for Ms. Wyman. Just, 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 just like to, to add to that that uh, uh, that uh, small steps have led us nowhere. We've been trying trying to do that, and. And uh, well, and uh, the time has come to uh, to present our case quite clearly. And uh, Vitaly Slansbergis and the Lithuanian uh, Supreme uh, Council have done that. Well, I should uh, also add that uh, Gorbachev has uh, well in the country uh, got. Well, in the country, he hasn't got that reputation. But, uh, well, outside his country, he's got a reputation of a reformer and a liberal, uh, well, having uh, actually produced very little reform. And, and uh, uh, I don't know whether, whether any liberalism at all. Well, we have uh, seen him being on, on television, being rude to Sakharov during the People's, uh, People's uh, Congress. He'd hushed, uh, hushed down, uh, well, hushed and, and uh, well, uh, the Armenian uh, deputation at a discussion uh, at the Supreme Soviet. Well, actually, well, he, uh, he uh, is uh, behaving himself. In the well, in these elected bo bodies or uh, well, half-appointed bodies, uh, well, as a di dictator, uh, and he has now assumed this these dictatorial power, these dictatorial powers. Um, could I just add something? Uh, I just wanted to say that people don't seem to remember that the Socialist movement has been 
active for the past two years and that uh, the movement towards independence was always part of the Sayudis platform and there were statements in even the Western press more than a month before the declaration uh, to restore independent statehood was made. So it wasn't something that was thought up at the last moment. Nothing of the sort. And the people who made that decision realized that they were making it with their lives. And they took it very seriously. Thank you. Hi, um, I'd like to play the devil's advocate a little bit. Um, it seems as though a large portion of the American public views Gorbachev a lot differently from the way that I think we do. Um, if you have polls in television and in newspapers where 60 to 70 percent when posed the question of whether we should support Gorbachev and his perestroika movement or whether we should support Lithuania, 60 to 70 percent said that we should support Gorbachev because he's moving in the right direction and we shouldn't undermine him. What response or what um, argument would you give to convince these people? <laughs> This is what I've already uh, started uh, started to uh, to uh, speak to you about. Well, Perist uh, Gorbachev has tried to create uh, uh, well the image of Perestroika as, as a holy uh, cow in India, something that is not to be to be to be touched. Yeah, but uh, actually there is very little, uh, well, quite little Perestroika in uh, in in the Soviet Union. Yes, we have uh, glasness, which is far from uh, from actual freedom of speech, because we know uh, what ha what is going what is Going in, uh, on in mass media now. At the time, uh, at the time uh, when uh, Lithuania has announced restoration of its independence, it's actually well disgusting to uh, to uh, watch uh, Soviet uh, Soviet television now, because they would, uh, if there is a dem demonstration of a bunch of uh, of conservative uh, retired officers uh, protesting against uh, Lithuanian independence, and uh, well, maybe three blocks away uh, there is a demonstration of 300,000 uh, people well in support of this uh, of this uh, independence so we'd actually be uh, be watching for half an hour or an hour this uh, well the first demonstration and uh, never hear anyone mention the other one right but the american people don't see the soviet televisions they only see what they see in america and that's the problem well that's 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 the problem indeed I would like to point out that this contradiction must be viewed as an artificial one because uh, the Baltic independence or real democracy and, uh, and ref reforms in Russia won't exclude each other. And I think uh, the major thing is to make clear for the Western public also is has Mr. Gorbachev uh, been up to restore genuine democracy or has he acted as representative of Communist Party, uh, having plans to maintain the Communist Party rule. I think we have had no conclusive pro proof that Gorbachev has had in mind real democratic reforms. And as we have said already, you can't have a genuine peace and stability without restore, restoring democracy and freedom, and also justice. So the di dilemma for the Soviet nationalities is that the Soviet Union is continuously prison of the nations and that those nationalities have lost faith in the promises offered by good Tsar. So the danger to the world, if we consider it really, lies not in the collapse of the Soviet Empire, but rather in an attempt to sustain it because the longer it is artificially sustained by the West, the more violent its explosion would be. I agree wholeheartedly with that, and I would say something in addition, and it's not sarcastic, that we need to teach geography in the schools, and we need to point out on the map where these countries are, because I think when the polls are, are made, uh, people make a decision because they don't know where Latvia or Lithuania or Estonia are. My, my question, I was going to ask you, um, anyway, uh, the, um, there are some leading journalists have stated that if we push too hard um, in a support of um, the Baltic states, that we will actually exacerbate 
this disintegration of the Soviet Union, and it could lead to civil war in, um, in the Baltic states. This was argued last night by Arnold de Borchov at the Kennedy Library, and I would like to know if you could follow up on that. Well, it is uh, uh, disintegration of the of the so of the Soviet uh, state or the Soviet Empire to be old-fashioned. But uh, the uh, the Soviet uh, uh, Union is an old-fashioned state, so I think that that it's quite appropriate to use this term. Uh, well, and dem uh, well, disintegration and democratization are too closely knit. Uh, well. Actually, actually, these are not uh, two processes, but it's, it's, uh, these are two aspects or the same process. Well, uh, so I think the more uh, support the democratic movements uh, gets, the, uh, the more there is peace and stability, as my colleague has just uh, said. Well, and uh, so uh, there will most probably be some kind of a civil conflict uh, in the Soviet Union. Uh, but, uh, but it's, uh, well, it depends on the Soviet Union and, uh, well, democratic movement and on the outside world and their involvement uh, in, in, the, in this crisis, uh, whether it will, uh, well, the outcome will be for the Democrats and uh, well, whether it will be a peaceful dismantling of the empire or an explosion. ask the panel a question that looks optimistically beyond the current crisis. Assuming that the leadership in Western nations, including the United States, ceases its temporizing and that there is a restoration of the independent governments in the Baltic states, and in view of the fact that the Baltic nations had a long pre-Soviet history of um, close economic and cultural ties to the West, is the best that can be hoped for some form of continued Soviet hegemony and something like Finland, Finlandization? Or is there real independence in the works somewhere further down the line? I would say Finland does not start with. <laughs> Projects are also discussed. Well, uh, that is, well, uh, uh, some kind of an, of an association with the European uh, Common Market, uh, some kind of an association with the Nordic Council and and the uh, Scandinavian uh, Scandinavian countries. Well, and then maybe some kind uh, some kind of uh, of an area where the uh, well the Western and well Eastern uh, uh, interests uh, would would. Uh, would come together uh, in trade and since, cooperation. Since time is running on, maybe I could exercise uh, the moderator's right to just say that maybe these two questions and then uh, call it an evening. My question might be um, a bit of the devil's advocate side, but um, how realistic is the view that the U.S. might be acting in defiance of international law and possibly breaking the UN Constitution if it was to support uh, Lithuania right now in, in its efforts of succession. Ms. Wyman, you seem, uh, you seem to have addressed it earlier in your Yes, I, I don't understand. Do you, I'm sorry, I don't understand your question. How, seeing, seeing that international law yeah. um, prohibits other states from helping other states that try to succeed, is that a realistic view if the yes, U.S. were to yes, say yes. that's its reasoning behind not helping Lithuania right now? Yes, you see, I would say that uh, on the contrary, uh, it would be in accordance with the United States policies and international law to help to regain Baltic independence because these countries are not part of the Soviet Union, so there's not interference in the internal, internal affairs of the Soviet Union. On the contrary, I, I would say that it would uh, bring such recognition, would bring uh, the United States policies toward Baltic countries to its logical conclusion. 
I would also add that, that uh, after the Second World War, uh, the Soviet Union was the only country that retained territory, occupied territory. Uh, the United States uh, occupied Japan, the United States has left Japan. United States occupied the Philippines. Maybe you don't think they've left the Philippines, but I think they've left the Philippines. Um, France uh, uh, also uh, withdrew. So the Soviet Union is the only country left which is still trying to hold on to the spoils of the Second World War. And the spoils of that war included all of Eastern Europe. And it's relinquished part of Eastern Europe. And now it must relinquish the rest of it. Thank you. Thank you. Assuming that uh, economic blockade is going to be an important weapon in the Soviet armory against the Baltic states in succession, what do you think, what would you recommend that practically uh, the United States and the Western world in general, including Western Europe, should do to assist the Baltic states in escaping from that uh, situation if and when it should arise in a serious way? I would say it is a very easy thing for the West uh, to be done. I think the Soviet uh, Union is in a such a weak position that the slightest uh, measure of economic pressure would, uh, would be sufficient to exclude uh, economic warfare against Lithuania or any other border countries. Uh, the Soviet Union is so much dependent of its export of gas and oil that if the West would curb the Soviet exports of oil, we know that, for example, just reaffirmation of the International Energy Agency Agreement from the year 1983 would be sufficient because under the terms of this particular agreement, it was uh, agreed that Western European countries must not ex uh, import more than 30% of its gas requirements from the Soviet Union. This agreement has, been, uh, uh, has not been, uh, been followed. So if uh, I think uh, even a hint or threat to that direction would be sufficient to, uh, to end the Soviet uh, economic warfare, warfare against the Baltic countries? Well, I, I want to be very practical. I think that, uh, well, I'm, I'm absolutely sure that uh, the Lithuanians will blockade or not blockade, would not give in and uh, wouldn't go back on their decisions. And most probably they would have, uh, well, uh, even before the, uh, the uh, strong Western uh, stance uh, begins to uh, to bring fruit in uh, in the uh, changing uh, Soviet Soviet position. Uh, I think that Lithuanians are, will have to face all kinds uh, all kinds of hardship, and I think uh, well direct uh, aid and direct help would also uh, be uh, be welcome and necessary. I mean, even if it's all, uh, if it's some kind of uh, of emergency shipments of. Uh, of, of, I don't know, goods or uh, it has to be considered what? It's the intercession of international organizations like the Red Cross and uh, the United Nations. Uh, I heard uh, President Landsbergis mention that he might ask the United Nations to call Lithuania a disaster area. Uh, I don't know the particulars of what, what that implies, but I think that makes a great deal of sense. Well, the hour is getting late, and I would like to express my personal appreciation of the panel and offer my thanks also to the ARCO Forum and to you, the audience, for such a stimulating <laughs> evening. Thank you very much.